Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the United States Institute of Peace, we're very pleased to welcome you this morning discussion on civil resistance and transitions. This is the third event in our series on people power, peace, and democracy. As mass protests continue to sweep the globe from the racial reckoning in the United States to the brave demonstrations of civil resistance in Myanmar, this question of how to achieve lasting change through nonviolent action is pressing. It's also very much at the heart of USIP's work. Peace research shows three very important things. First, nonviolent campaigns are twice as likely to achieve their goals as violent campaigns. Second, political transitions that are initiated through nonviolent action are three times as likely to result in peace and democracy. And thirdly, peace processes that are inclusive, especially of women, are more likely to last. Today, we've brought together a panel of researchers and activists to discuss the impact of inclusion, dialogue, and negotiation on the path to sustainable and just peace. We're very pleased to introduce the panelists to you. First, Dr. Jonathan Pickney, who is the senior researcher here at USIP. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Veronique Dudouet, who is the senior advisor for the Bird Dog Foundation. Both of them will be briefing us on important and recent research that they've conducted. We're also very pleased to welcome Dr. Ramon Gabriel Olar. He is the associate professor in political science at Trinity College in Dublin. Dr. Rahman is going to be briefing us about his research on nonviolence, action, inclusive dialogue, negotiation, and how all of this can build trust in people in their own democracies and in governance. We're very pleased to have two activists with us, including activists and researchers, Zaid Boussant, who will share his view on the transition in Tunisia 10 years after the 2011 uprising. Zaid is with us right now from Tunis. And we're also pleased to introduce activist Zara Haider, who will share her views on the democratic transition in Sudan. Zara is in Khartoum. We are still trying to connect with her. We hope that she'll be with us in just a few moments. We'll begin with the discussion among our panelists, and then we'll shift to questions from the audience. We encourage everyone to put their questions in the chat box below the video feed and to share them on social media using the hashtag #PeoplePowerForPeace. We'd like to start with Jonathan and Veronique, and our first questions to you are about the research that you've been doing on nonviolent dialogue and negotiation and transitions. We'd be very pleased if you would share the results of that research with us and some of the conclusions that you draw. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Lise. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to be here this morning uh, and to be able to discuss uh, some of this research that we've been doing. Um, I'll introduce it a little bit and then turn things over to my, to my colleague, Veronique, uh, to go into a little bit more detail. So as you mentioned, there's this, there's this research finding out there showing that transitions initiated through nonviolent action tend to lead to more peace and democracy than transitions initiated through any other mechanism. But of course, there are a lot of exceptions to that. There's a lot of variation in that. And so we really wanted to understand how do we, you know, how do we map that sort of uncertain road from nonviolent action successful, you know, a, a nonviolent action campaign achieving their goals uh, to the establishment of a new sustainable democracy. And we, we had, a, had a suspicion, uh, based on what we know about peace processes and inclusive dialogue, that inclusion was going to be one really key factor that was going to explain that. Uh, so we looked at every political transition initiated through nonviolent action uh, from the end of World War II until the present and collected data on all of the dialogue and negotiation processes that took place in those transitions. And what we found uh, is, is quite striking. Uh, while dialogue on its own uh, doesn't have any impact on future levels of democracy, when dialogue and negotiation processes are highly inclusive, when people, when people from a diverse set of voices are at the table, and when there are mechanisms in place to make that inclusion meaningful, uh, then that leads to much higher levels uh, of future democracy uh, at the end of the transition. 
So that's sort of the, the 10,000 foot high statistical view. Uh, and then Veronique, I think you can share some more about uh, some of the specific cases that we've looked at uh, as well. Great. So good morning, good afternoon also to all of you from my side. Uh, I'm grateful to USIP for organizing this panel and especially for making it a joint event with my organization, the Bava Foundation, since the research was indeed conducted in close coordination between our respective teams. Um, following my fellowship at USIP uh, a couple of years ago, and I would say that our two organizations share a strong commitment to bringing together the research and the practice communities of peace building and nonviolent action. Um, so um, I was very motivated working on this research together with Jonathan, and we have partnered by making this a mixed um, method approach with Jonathan leading the statistical analysis, and he, made, he may zoom in on some of the, on the findings a bit later, while I looked at the case study work. Um, for this research, we decided to look at three transitions that occurred in the last uh, decade. So on the one hand, the Arab Spring revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, which happened in 2011, as well as the revolution of dignity or the Euromaidan revolution in Ukraine in 2014. Um, all three transitions were precipitated by a popular uprising with pro-democracy, revolutionary youth, and women, I would say, at the forefront of those movements. And all, in all three cases, there were instances of transitional dialogue and negotiations, but they varied significantly in terms of their inclusivity, but also in terms of their outcomes on democratization and stability. Um, so ranging, I want to say, from an emerging democracy in Tunisia to a relatively open but not very democratic society in Ukraine to a new autocracy in Egypt. So in all three cases, we looked at the nature of uh, dialogue and negotiation, and we focused more particularly on the participation and the interaction of three key groups of actors. So incumbent elites or the, the former government, aspiring country elites represented by opposition political parties and activists from nonviolent action movement. Um, what we found, I would say across the case was that nonviolent pro-democracy movements helped precipitate a political transition but then played rather secondary or minor role during the bargaining and the decision-making that takes place and that shapes the new rules of the game. Somehow they got sidelined by the establishment and by country elites who took center stage in those spaces. Of course, there's a lot of variation across the cases. So we found that Tunisia had the most inclusive transitional bodies and dialogue formats represent representing all major political forces such as religious and secular forces, left and right, old and new, um, revolutionary youth were not directly represented in all of those dialogue for us, but they influenced their course a lot from the outside through sustained street action. And also so thanks to the role of civil society as insider mediators, such as the National Dialogue Quartet, which I would say helped those dialogue formats to have a high level of revolutionary legitimacy. By contrast, in the cases of Egypt and Ukraine, we found a, a number of factors that impeding inclusive dialogues, ranging from um, actors that had to do with the nature of nonviolent movements, the heterogeneity of opposition parties and movements, the lack of experience that they had in negotiation, the lack of unified long-term vision for the country, but also I would say the divide and rule strategies that uh, the former elites used to prevent um, consensual dialogue and to foment divisions among opposition groups. The International Committee also had a role to play either by its absence, such as in the case of Egypt, where they, we, we were struck by the absence of mediators, or by, I would say, their dominance and the presence of big spoilers, such as the role of, of Russia in Ukraine. So um, at the end of the report, we make a few takeaways, especially for international peace building agencies, such as, for instance, we ask peace building agencies not to approach dialogue or negotiation in nonviolent led transitions in the same way that they would in a civil war um, by not looking at civil society and nonviolent activists as, as nice to have constituencies that will help to bring more sustainable peace, but as actually parties in their own rights. They are part of the conflict constellation and they really need to be 
included in, in those transition spaces. That transitions need to be more than symbolic, and I think we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, there needs to be a lot more training, education, and capacity building for grassroots activists in preparing them for effective participation in dialogue and negotiation practice. Um, there needs to also be a space for them to continue to put pressure from the street for those dialogue and negotiations to conclude successfully. And finally, there needs to be a lot of more emphasis on enabling female leaders of those movements to, uh, to be there. And uh, again, I hope we'll, we'll be able to come back to this topic, but the role of women was found to be preponderant in enabling transitions to be effective through their participation in dialogue and negotiation. Uh, Berenice, Jonathan, thank you very much. It's very impressive research and it raises a number of extremely interesting points, including the ones about inclusion that where inclusion is broad-based, where it's meaningful, where the international community indicates that it's very important, then uh, clearly it's more effective. But where elites are able to, in a sense, push out civil society and crack a deal between themselves, it's also obvious that that is a less sustainable and a less enduring way of going forward. One of the things that I think your research points to is how important it is that certain kinds of inclusion happen. And Veronique, you touched on this. If you could say more about the kinds of inclusion that your research shows are very meaningful and impactful. Yeah, so I can mention a few words about that and then uh, and then pass it over to Veronique again. So we were really, uh, we, we thought this was a really crucial point that oftentimes uh, inclusion in dialogue and negotiation processes can be just this sort of tick the box exercise of, you know, someone from, we have, we have a woman here, we have someone from civil society here, we have someone from youth here, um, and without sort of mechanisms in place to ensure that that inclusion, that sort of that seat at the table uh, is actually meaningful, can actually have an impact. Um, and so in the statistical portion of our research, we looked at things like what's the selection mechanism uh, for what brings people to the table? What are the decision-making mechanisms through which the dialogue or negotiation process comes to conclusions? Uh, and then sort of what's what's the actual balance of power at the table? You know, who is able to sort of set agendas um, and who has to sort of take a back seat? And it's really and and what we find is that almost none of these factors, like none of these factors on their own, have a really significant impact on future levels of democracy. It's only when they are together, when you have this full sort of suite of of mechanisms in place uh, to ensure that uh, to ensure that inclusion uh, is is not just present but meaningful. Uh, the one exception to this, I will say, uh, that we are we were particularly interested in highlighting uh, is the participation of women. That even just sort of absent any of these other factors, the participation of women in transitional dialogue and negotiation processes has a very significant uh, positive impact uh, on on future levels of democracy. So in general, you know, it's crucial that sort of uh, the inclusive nature of, of dialogue and negotiation processes needs to be broad. It needs to involve lots of different uh, aspects of the dialogue process. Uh, but, in, but particularly crucial and important is this aspect of the, of the participation of women. Uh, Veronique, is there anything else you would like to, to add? Um, no, I think what, what you've said uh, is very much reflected in the case study work as well, where we found, I mean, to, to get, take the, maybe the negative examples of Egypt and Ukraine, the few instances of attempted or aborted dialogue and negotiation that we found, actually we found that the revolutionary youth were um, either represented by self-appointed representatives or by traditional op opposition parties to, to, to whom they lent themselves being represented but who then ended up having no direct mandate for them and lacking credibility with the protesters and which led to actually the outcomes of those deals being rejected by the streets because, because of that. So uh, again, it's not so much about who is there, but also where does the mandate come from? Uh, which yeah, which uh, relationship do they have with, with the movements? Uh, and in terms of balance of power, I would stress the equal importance of having 
grassroots movements represented to also having old elites represented to make sure that they don't become spoilers down the road mm -hmm. so that you know, if they if they see that the that the transition the institutional sorry the transitional institutions and the dialogue process become too much dominated by the the new elites the counter elites such as maybe the muslim brotherhood in egypt then uh, those 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 old elites might uh, just uh, interrupt the transition and make sure to reassert themselves and then all of the gains are lost uh, Veronique Donahue, it's very interesting. If you allow me just a final question. Did your research look at the role of the, the private sector, either as a positive factor in many of these processes or a negative one? The private sector wasn't uh, wasn't an, an explicit focus of, of say like the statistical portion of the research. Uh, we didn't sort of collect data specifically on that. Uh, Veronique, I'm not sure if you have any uh, insights uh, or specific thoughts on the, the role of the private sector uh, in some of the cases that we looked at. Um, well, the, the one example I can think of, and maybe Zaid can also touch on that, is in the, in the national dialogue uh, process in Tunisia, how the civil society entities that were actually mediating that process also had a representative from the, the business uh, association which made sure that maybe the private sector would also feel um, represented and, and, and protected in any outcome that would come up out of the, of the agreement. Um, but that's kind of the, the one uh, notable exception that, that I can think of, and I'm sure there would be, yeah, that would be another research piece in itself. Jonathan Verdi, thank you very much for sharing the results of the very impressive research that you've undertaken. Uh, Dr. Roman, if we can turn to you, we would like uh, you to share with us this very interesting perspective that you brought to your research, where you've been looking at uh, the way in which citizens gain trust in democracy and in their governance arrangements. If you could share with us how you've done the research and what your key findings are. Yes, thank you very much for the questions, and thank you very much for, for having me here today to share uh, my, my research on how contentious processes, non-violent resistance, but also these negotiation events that both Jonathan and Veronique have, have investigated affect how people perceive democracy, right? Because in the in the literature on democratic survival and also democratic support, we know the extent to which citizens and individuals support democracy is the glue that holds democracies together. We know that regimes in which uh, citizens are more supportive of democracy tend to survive longer and because they reject authoritarian alternatives, because they reject anti-system parties or in in individuals, and also they are more stand up and try to fight to keep to keep democracy right and if we look at uh, democracy especially nascent democracies like it has men been mentioned previously these nascent democracy as are in a big danger of reverting back to authoritarianism right why because elites have every incentive to keep their to try to keep as much as possible the, their uh, their access to state resources. And as we saw in the case of Egypt, when the opportunity arose, elites were swift to return back to a version of authoritarianism that was even harsher than the uh, than the one than the one before, right? But when it comes to to democratic support. The building democratic support in this new democracy is very, very hard because citizens that emerge from these autocracies, they do have an idea of a democracy, but very often they need to learn the norms associated with democratic politics. So they need to build their trust and their support for democracy. So it's not as it is, right? But when, also when it comes to established democracies, democratic support, important because democratic support has been conceptualized as being, again, this, uh, this glue that pushes against any kind of backsliding to authoritarianism. And just to give two examples of, of how democratic support affected democracies, if you look, for instance, at, at, at Venezuela, who was seen as a, uh, as a model democracy in Latin America, in the first survey that the Pew Research Center ran there in 1995, so three to four years before, before Hugo Chavez became president, about over 45 percent uh, of the respondents said that democracy won't solve their, their problems, and over 80 percent declared that a strong leader would be needed in order to solve the issues of mm -hmm. that Venezuela was encountering at the, at the moment, right? So if we use that as a warning signal, 
a few years later, in hindsight, uh, Hugo Chavez became president through free and fair elections and then moved in, a, in transforming Venezuela into, into an autocracy, the one that we know it is uh, today, right? But also more close, for instance, in, in Europe, in Poland, Poland was seen as the golden child of emerging out of communism and becoming an, a consolidated democracy. But starting in the mid to, uh, 2000s, more and more individuals declared that they were dissatisfied with democracies, right? And that led to so much disillusionment and so, so such a drop in electoral participation that in 2015, the current party that is in, that is in power was able to win the elections based on an anti-democratic and anti-system platform. And we see a democratic backsliding in, in Poland to him that emerged and was seen as the golden child of emerging out of communism. Um, Marlon, that's very interesting. And if I understand well, you're making a, a very interesting, a very compelling argument that if in the peace processes itself, people are learning about democratic norms, this helps to educate everyone on how those norms should be exercised and is also a buffer that helps to prevent a backslide into authoritarianism. Um, that's a bold statement. Is there more that you can say about it or more illustrations that you can give us? Yeah, so actually I was interested and that's, that's the part of, of the research that you have helped me look into it. What is the effect of nonviolent mobilization of, of how people perceive democracy, or how do people feel about democracy in this regime that emerged out of nonviolence, right? Because we have a lot of emerging evidence from Jonathan's research, but others people research as well, that nonviolent resistance is a of democratization, but also of democratic survival. So my interest is, my interest was in is this mechanism of democratic support the one that's driving this relationship of one the, of the possible explanation, right? And my expectation was that nonviolent resistance is going to increase the extent to which people support democracy because participating, participating in nonviolent resistance and probably Zaid and Zara will have more insights about they participate in nonviolent resistance. It's a risky business. It's, it's very dangerous and it's very hard Results and to obtain uh, democracy, right? So my expectation was that people are going to be more supportive of democracy if they had to work harder in a way to give it. But I was wrong. It actually statistical analysis shows that actually in regimes that emerge out of nonviolence transitions, people are actually less supportive of of democracy. And I found that puzzling, and I wanted to understand a bit better why. So that's why I, I looked at these uh, negotiations. Jonathan and Veronique mentioned, and to see how that impacts or how any kind of consensus building during these transitions help share, shape democratic support. And again, there were some uh, findings and some that were not. So again, holding a, a negotiation event during these transitions doesn't seem to affect in any shape or form or uh, in any meaning democratic support. But when we look at the characteristics of of these uh, of these negotiation events, we find some some findings that are very similar to the that Jonathan and Veronique mentioned. So, precisely, uh, uh, I find that um, negotiation events that were dominated by the previous elites, in which previous elites have had the upper hand and they're the one, in a way, driving the negotiations, actually over time leads to less democratic support. Again, indicating that people react to this perceived injustice about who might have hijacked the the, mm -hmm. the transitions that they were they fight fight it for for so long on the other hand the good news is that uh, these negotiation events that were reached through what I called consensus so what I mean consensus is that the decisions during the during the negotiations were taken through majority decision in which small group had veto power where there was uh, where they were negotiating over major political change or over the next order, and they resulted in an agreement of all the participa participants in the negotiations. Those kind of negotiations are uh, systematically associated with more with more democratic support. So it's not all bad. It actually, further indicates that it's a more complex story than I might have come or some people have, might have come with some prior prior expectations. 
And what it points to, Roman, is that if you really want a peace process to result in a lasting solution, you have to invest in the way the peace process itself works. Yes. And if you ignore that, you do so at your peril. It's very interesting work. Um, we're very pleased that Zara Haider has been able to join us from Khartoum. Zara, you are very welcome. We introduced you earlier, and we're so pleased that you've been able to, to come online with us. Um, we'd like now to, to turn to Zaid and to talk about Tunisia. Um, Zaid, both Jonathan and Veronique have referred to Tunisia. Dr. Roman also talked about this as a very important example of how nonviolent action as part of the transition has helped to propel your transition process in a very positive direction. It's been um, 11 years since the transition, and we're very interested in your views on how the transition itself worked and what its impact has been. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you to Jonathan, Veronique, uh, Roman, uh, for uh, the ideas that will help me uh, go forward with the, the giving an idea about the 10 years of this uh, transition transition of course 10 10 years uh, is a long period of time to uh, let's say sum up what happened in tunisia or in any other country uh, and what i can say is that um, it's obvious after 10 years that dialogue was the best and most efficient tool uh, we had in tunisia to solve uh, crisis, whether uh, uh, we're talking about political crisis or social crisis, uh, uh, social movements uh, all around the country. Um, maybe the three best examples I would mention uh, uh, about dialogue being used as a tool to solve uh, uh, issues uh, um, would be the first one in 2011, right after uh, Ben Ali left the country and uh, left the power. Uh, we had uh, this council, uh, the High Authority to, of Protection of the Revolution, that gathered around the, uh, 100 activists, political actors, um, private sector uh, representatives, unions, civil society organizations, uh, and led by Ayaz Ben Ashur. And uh, this uh, institution was the best uh, idea ever, in my opinion, of course, uh, to help transition from an authoritarian regime to the National Constituent Assembly uh, a year after without creating any void or any uh, uh, any disruption uh, into the political process in Tunisia. The second example was mentioned by Veronique uh, earlier in 2013, 2014. We've been through a major, probably the biggest uh, uh, or deepest uh, political crisis uh, in Tunisia right before the constitution was adopted in January 2014. Uh, and we had this quartet uh, of uh, organizations, mainly civil society, uh, uh, basically the major union um, uh, here in Tunisia, UGTT, UTICA, which is the Business uh, Representatives Association, uh, the Tunisian League of Protection of Human Rights, and uh, the Union of uh, Lawyers. And the four, four of the uh, these institutions got um, a few years after the, the priest, Nobel Peace Prize uh, for solving the crisis and finding a new path uh, through this national dialogue in Tunisia. And the third one uh, I would mention would be um, not an event per se, uh, but a longer uh, process, which is the parliament. I it would be obvious for all of you uh, that I, I would mention this, but the uh, People's Representatives Assembly, the Parliament in Tunisia, is probably the best uh, scene, the best theater, if I may say so, um, in terms of dialogue. Because as Veronique said, it gathers so many different political actors. And if, um, probably, let's say, 95% of the political specter or, or the political uh, uh, range of political opinions and ideas are represented at the parliament. The five missing percent would be the clearly violent uh, political actors, which exist in Tunisia, but are not represented uh, at the parliament. Hopefully, uh, will never be represented. But the 95 percent uh, uh, leading the parliament give Tunisia or give Tunisian citizens an idea of how ideas are conveyed, how dialogue are, are done, uh, both in a successful way and in failures, because the parliament is not uh, cannot be seen only as a successful institution. And uh, sadly, in 2021, I can say that what we are seeing uh, at the parliament in Tunisia is an example of what a failing dialogue looks like. 
um, I can go a lot of, uh, longer and deeper in this, but I will leave that for uh, the section, uh, Q&A section. Um, but uh, what I might be interested in adding to this uh, ideas is probably the obstacles we, we've met in Tunisia in terms of dialogue uh, since the 10 past years. Um, and the main one, and, and that's the one I have a tendency to talk about the most, is the political instability. For the past 10 years in Tunisia, we've had 10 uh, different governments. Each government coming with a new team of uh, ministers, with a new team of appointed officials, even in the regions. So it, uh, this political inst instability is impacting uh, all level of administration. So when we're dealing with so social movements or, in, or NGOs or activists, uh, the, the biggest challenge is to keep a narrative with uh, the administration, with the, the Tunisian state, because faces change a lot. Ideas behind those faces will obviously change a lot from uh, an Islamist governor, I would say in Gathrin or Janduba, to uh, one appointed by the old or the, the representatives of the old regime uh, uh, or people represented by or appointed by technocrats. You will find yourself throughout years uh, in front of different vis-a-vis -vis and in front of different people that, and there's no continuity, let's say, uh, in uh, this uh, representation. So the hardest part, I think, is to keep this uh, political instability uh, at the central or very national level and avoid it uh, having it uh, impacting uh, uh, local affairs. The second thing, and I'm not going to go into details with that, is probably corruption. Dialogue, and I'm, I'm, this is what I'm going at, at the personal level, uh, digging deep into uh, how uh, corruption at many levels um, is jeopardizing dialogue. It changes all the rules of the game. Uh, it changes uh, 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 the, the announced interests of each uh, party uh, or each vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, is different from the inner real or unofficial uh, interests. So um, as I told you, Liz, before the beginning of uh, this um, uh, webinar, I, I'm uh, doing trainings or running trainings with USIP uh, under a, a program called Synergizing Nonviolent Activism and Peace Building SNAP uh, with uh, three different groups in Tunisia. And uh, what is coming out of these uh, uh, trainings, the most, uh, let's say, impressive or common point between all activists uh, uh, are these two points, political instability that avoids or, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, creates a disruption into uh, the faces or voices from the official part on one hand and corruption uh, as uh, uh, jeopardizing dialogue on the other hand. And this is mostly what Tunisia looks like uh, today. Say thank you. That was a very interesting analysis. And, and as you were speaking, I think many of us were reflecting back on comments that Jonathan Veronique and Roman have made about how an inclusive process in many ways can act as a buffer against a backslide into authoritarianism. Do you think that Tunisia is a good example of that or not yet fully an example of that? Uh, this is a tough question to answer. I think what makes Jonathan and Veronique, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, place Tunisia in the positive example uh, is the comparison with other countries. So yes, if you compare Tunisia to Egypt, I would go uh, uh, on that way. But I do live in Tunisia, and I do, uh, I am like 11 million other Tunisians victim of uh, uh, what the political scene in Tunisia looks like, what the absence of uh, uh, a mature and sane dialogue looks like. Uh, uh, I'm a victim, like 11 other million Tunisians, of what extremist ideas uh, look like. Uh, so I, it's a tough question to answer, but I think I did in a way. <laughs> <laughs> See, thank you so much. Zara, we're delighted that you're able to join us uh, from Khartoum. You're very thank welcome. You. Um, Thank you. We're very interested in your insights and your views and your analysis of this incredible transition uh, that's taken place in your country. Yeah, the scene now, especially in Sudan, is very confusing and it's very complicated, really. Uh, and um, unfortunately, there is a lot 
of institutional and political uh, incipients, unfortunately, from all components and in all uh, levels. But anyway, um, to talk about negotiation and dialogue in light of democratic transition, uh, we must uh, distinguish between two uh, negotiations existed in Sudan. The first one is between uh, the uh, security committee uh, that exists, that uh, for, uh, formed by al-Bashir himself uh, in the end of his uh, regime time, uh, to put, and to attempt uh, to manage the collapse uh, in his uh, regime, and uh, the revolution forces, which known at that time uh, freedom and change uh, forces. So uh, this negotiation, the aim of this negotiation is handing power from al-Bashir regime to uh, the revolution uh, power. But uh, anyway, um, the handling is not complete, any completing uh, very well or 100% um, for many uh, reasons. Uh, but that's why the second negotiation is very important, which negotiation now between the government of Sudan with two uh, parties, the civilian and milit military parties, with um, arms movement. Uh, who are in, in long war in uh, yani civilian, uh, civil war in, in, in Sudan. Uh, the cause of the importance of this negotiation because um, there is uh, a lot of point in the agenda pushed by the army movement and also by uh, the civilian part of the government to uh, returning uh, the agenda of revolution and supporting um, uh, democratic transition uh, transition in Sudan. Uh, fortunately, um, there is agreement signed uh, at the recent, yeah, the last uh, months between uh, government and some of this uh, movement, our movement, and still un until the moment there is a negotiation between the big pa parties of the army's movement, which is uh, SPLM, led by uh, al Hilu and um, Sudan Liberation uh, Movement, led by Abdel Wahid. The agenda of these two uh, parties and even the, the um, the army parties is very it's very important for the people in, inside Sudan. It's concerning com completing uh, the institution institution document, um, yeah, any directions and um, the of the of the army, uh, and also um, yeah, any, uh, integrated of army and the mobilization of militias. Um, transition justice and uh, something like uh, secularism um, and a lot of things. And all this, we uh, can, and most of them, uh, we can call it the uh, street demands now for democracy tra transition in Sudan. But anyway, there is a lot of challenge also in Sudan, actually big challenge in Sudan. Uh, one of them, lack of transparency between uh, the revolution uh, forces itself. There is a mistrust uh, um, Yani gap, it's extend every day, every day more. Uh, there is a lack of um, vision of how the transition should be. Uh, we feel it from the government and for the parties of revolutions, the yani political parties of revolution. Uh, of course, external intervention. It's um, and it's affecting a lot in Sudan. Uh, regional conflict concerning uh, Nile water, which is a new things now. It's affecting a lot uh, the situation in Sudan. Uh, economic collapse is the biggest uh, one. There is um, there is a lack even of agreement to clear economic recovery program. Um, also, continuing conflict in in many regions in Sudan, conflict and war in several regions in Sudan. And there is a big failure of a military um, part to play their role in this area. Uh, and also, uh, we feel like our, our uh, civilian government is very weak um, to dealing with this session. There is a lack of security, even in here in Khartoum. Uh, police is uh, always playing the role of watching. They didn't do their work very well. So you, you can see the... the, the the, the scenes now. Uh, justice has been delayed until the moment. People feel like uh, Al-Bashir will not go to the, and it will not get his punish, although he's in, in the gym, but uh, there is a lot of things is not happening. Yani, we don't see any killer um, had his, his yani, punish till the moment. Um, there is a, a lot of corruption, of course, economic and even uh, 
political uh, economic. So this is the sense now in, in Sudan. And I will tell you the general sense for people in the street in Sudan that uh, the um, security committee that exists by al-Bashir is playing the role of the Bashir regime till the moment. They protect their, their um, benefits till the moment. They're trying to put, um, yeah, the challenge, they're trying to challenge uh, the justice. They're trying to even challenging the, the democratic transition till the, the moment. And at the same time, uh, we feel like uh, the government, uh, that's that the sense of the street. The government, the civilian part of the government is very weak. And what it's very clear that there is a lot of conflict between the component of civilian um, uh, government and even uh, on the uh, political uh, umbrella of, uh, of the revolution. So this is the situation in Sudan. I'm sorry, thank you. It's a very interesting um, uh, set of factors that you are describing. And, and one of the things that, that Dr. Roman shared with us is the research that he does often will focus on the relationship between the trust that citizens have in their governments and whether or not the peace process delivering on the promises that it's been made. And what's very striking about what you described is that that may not be happening in Sudan. Exactly. That the promises that have been made may in fact impact the way that Sudanese all across your country view their government and view the transition. Is there anything you'd like to share on that issue about the trust between people and the process itself? Actually, if you, Yanni, if anybody just watch what uh, it's going in this Yanni, Yanni social media in, in Sudan, it's, it's clear that uh, the relation between the street uh, or the revolution power, which we have um, a very, Yanni, very strong um uh, bodies, which is uh, neighborhoods committees. It's, it's not very organized. It's a movement. You can say it's demand movement in the street. There is a hesitated relation between this, uh, these powers with the government. You know, sometimes it's going very well and sometimes it's very bad. Uh, and uh, that's related of the what, how can you, uh, what uh, Hamdou government achieves in the ground. For example, when the relationship with the world, we back to the world, people are very happy. I mean, they go to street about that and said, thank you, Hamdouk, in the social media and other things. But when we, like yesterday, there is um, uh, yani, a body of people found who killed in for two years by the militaries. And there is no justice. People are very angry and feel like this government will not reach justice at all. So the relation is very, very, very uh, hesitated. And I think um, our government still have the chance to uh, return uh, the, the support from the street if uh, they are, in my opinion, and that's my opinion, if they are um, go to street and tell people what's happening inside, what's happening inside the government, uh, what's happening from the military parties, and people will support for civilian uh, any part of our government. Zara, thank you. It's now time for our questions and comments from the floor. We're very pleased uh, to, to receive these. If you can share them either on chat um, or through the social media feed, we are pleased to take those. We have a question for Zaid and Zara. And the question is, how have youth movements changed in their role in influencing the policies and governance in Tunisia and in Sudan since the transition? And there's a very specific follow-up question. Have these youth groups become more influential and connected or less so, and why? Zaid? Um, this is a question, a question that is coming, uh, keep coming back in, in Tunisia. Let's say youth movements after uh, 2011, uh, let's say between 2011 and 2016, uh, used to form around legal entities, associations. That was the best, or seen as being the best uh, way to uh, move as a group, to act legally, to uh, be represented uh, officially. Um, but we've witnessed since, let's say, 2016, I can tell you why, but uh, 2016, 2017, that uh, um, youth groups or social movements 
movements led by youth, uh, young activists, uh, tend to avoid uh, getting into these uh, official or, or institutionalized uh, formats and mm -hmm. prefer, uh, rather prefer uh, dealing with public officials or public affairs or putting pressure on officials uh, through unofficial uh, uh, ways or movements. Uh, this is what I can say about the, the form. But uh, uh, have they become more influential? Hard to say. Uh, the political scene is uh, quite uh, disorganized. Uh, but you have to know that um, uh, let's say in an official way, le le for to become uh, uh, a parliamentarian, for example, the law um, doesn't le doesn't let people uh, under 23 years old become uh, parliamentarians, and uh, uh, for the president of the republic in Tunisia, it's uh, under 35. But for uh, for the case of Kai Saeed, the president of Tunisia, elected in 2019, he was mostly. Uh, pushed by a group of young activists. And this is the best example, uh, in my opinion, of uh, a group of young people uh, uh, coming together to push for a candidate in election. So it might work. I have only Qaisaid as an example to give. Um, but if it worked once, it might work again in the future. Sarah? Yeah, uh, there is different types of uh, youth movement in Sudan before the revolution and till the moment. Yeah, there is a, a, a political um, movement, a political change movement. Uh, this uh, group of, of movement are either disappear after revolution or be part of the government. For example, uh, many of ministers now and um, in the big uh, position government are used and are activists before uh, the revolution. So youth in Sudan, we can say from the moment they participate in the government in different things. Uh, but uh, we, as I said, we have different types of, of movement, yeah, youth movement. For example, after revolution, uh, as I said before, uh, the. Um, Neighborhoods committees is a youth movement now in the street, and they are uh, preferred to be far than government. They are playing the role of watching and monitoring what the government doing. They, you see them uh, if there is something wrong in the street, and they demonstrate immediately. And there is also demands groups uh, of, um, yeah, it's a youth movement, and these groups are continuing, continuing. Uh, and raising their demands for the government before the issue going, and now after revolution, they continuing doing uh, that. So, uh, and each group had their position on on situation, but I think it's a very interesting uh, position is neighborhoods committee's uh, position, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a lot of negotiation, uh, dialogue now inside the neighborhoods committees in participating in parliament coming parliament are they will participate or not and how they participate because as you said as i said they are not very well organized to um, have uh, to elect their participants in, in in the parliament and they can push uh, any decision yeah, they have this power to to you know, motivate the street and go to and demonstrate and continue and they there is a slogan called it's continue it means the revolution it's continue after two years or three years Zara, say thank you for that. Jonathan, we have a question for you. Uh, there's a civilian resistance movement happening right now in Myanmar. How do you see its members being innovative? And have these people learned lessons from other movements in the past that you can see? Thank you. That's a really wonderful question. Um, before I get into that, I'll just say one quick thing regarding the the research that we've been discussing before. I should have mentioned this before. This is going to be this is forthcoming in a, a report from USIP that should be uh, coming out in the next uh, in the next month or two. Um, just for those of you who are who are looking for that, um, on the on the question of Myanmar, um, I have been just so, so impressed over and over again by the courage um, of, the, of the, the activists in Myanmar, by their, by their innovation, uh, by their resilience uh, in the face of, I mean, truly, truly brutal repression um, by, the, by the military in the aftermath of the February 1st coup. A few particular avenues where I think the, the movement in Myanmar has been particularly uh, innovative, um, tactical diversity. Uh, that 
while the movement started out mostly doing you know, what you might think of as traditional protests and demonstrations, um, particularly as repression increased, uh, we've seen them move to other kinds of tactics that are less vulnerable uh, to the kinds of sort of direct on the street repression that's happened from the military. So whether that's a, you know, a, a silent stay at home strike uh, where people are not going like not going into work, but are staying in their houses all day uh, as a form of protest. Um, or sort of uh, splashing red paint uh, around the cities to symbolize the, the violent repression that's been directed towards them, um, or uh, utilizing uh, sort of gender constructs uh, in, the, in the context of Myanmar by, for instance, you know, hanging traditional women's clothing uh, above their protests, uh, which uh, in sort of a sort of, there's a superstition in Myanmar that if a, if a man passes under that, then it will sort of sap his masculinity. Um, and so using this, as a, as a means of sort of countering uh, the, the sort of attempts at repression by the, by the military. Um, and so I think there certainly is a lot of, there's a lot of learning uh, happening there in that movement. Uh, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity, um, but just a, a truly sort of brutal and uh, an implacable opponent. Um, and so I think it's, it, we're at a really crucial moment uh, with, uh, with that movement where you know, there's been kind of sustained repression for, for over a month now. Um, increasingly sort of segments of the movement are, are, see, are you know, the, people are saying that, uh, you know, we, we don't see nonviolence working, so maybe we need to turn to a more, uh, to a more violent form of resistance. Uh, which you know what what we know from the research is that those you know violent campaigns tend to be less successful and and it, indeed they tend to result in much more much higher levels of violence and repression throughout the like throughout the society as well. So I think this is a really this is a really crucial moment um, both for people within Myanmar and for the the international community as well to be speaking very forcefully uh, that. Violence against peaceful protesters is is unacceptable, uh, and that there really there needs to be a change uh, in that uh, in that country. Jonathan, thank you, Robin. We have a question for you. Um, elections are generally viewed as signposts of a strong democracy. How have elections or electoral processes affected the trust factor that's so important for democracy that you've identified? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and actually, that's that's something that I'm that I'm working on a on a separate on a separate project in trying to understand again this how how elections how, or how transitions that occur through elections uh, affect uh, democ democratic support. And once again, the results are a bit mixed, and they are not as as straightforward as we expect. But also, that indicates the need that. The need to understand better what's uh, what's going on here, right? Because first of all, whether uh, elections are associated with democratizations is still a contentious contentious discussion. There's still no consensus in, in the literature as to whether elections by themselves lead to to democracy. And we have findings and arguments on both over the aisle. But in my own research that I'm that I'm currently working with with the University of Glasgow, we look at how transitions that happen through elections affect, uh, affect democratic support. And here, we don't really find a consistent effect. We find that under certain conditions, just elect transitions that take place through elections do, do increase uh, democratic support, but very often it's context dependent. And once again, I think it goes back to this idea that the characteristics of the elections matter, right? So I think that ultimately it matters the extent to which the elections are being perceived as being free and fair, the extent to which the elections are being perceived as allowing alternative voices or allowing maybe opposition members uh, to participate and actually to be elected and to be, to have voice to the main uh, to the main process and to the main message that is being dictated by former elites or by by the regime. So again, I think that the quality of the elections is the one that is going to affect how much uh, uh, people uh, support democracy and the extent to which they are they are willing to work with with the democracies. And I think that in the cases where those elections do allow. Uh, opposition voices and do allow civil society to participate, we are more likely to see this perception of fairness and thereby support for, for democracy. 
Um, thank you. Uh, for one of our final questions, um, Veronique, you spoke very interestingly about the research that showed that the inclusion, particularly of women, was very significant in ensuring that a peace process was lasting and sustainable. Um, we'd like you to say more about that. Can you explain why that seems to be the case and what it is about women's participation that ensures that the processes are more robust and substantial than otherwise? Yeah, sure. Um, well, so the, I would say that on the role of women, uh, our research uh, largely confirms what the um, civil war and conflict resolution literature has found about uh, the importance of including women at the negotiation table for sustainable results. And so we found that in transitions that are born out of nonviolent um, resistance and movements, the, 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 the same, um, basically, the, this, this uh, finding is confirmed. Um, this was a statistical finding, um, so you know, like um, we did not go into the fine grain analysis in the case studies as to why why that was. It's especially because I would say that in the case studies we largely looked at cases where women failed to be adequately represented, or if they were, um, there were there were women who were actually part of the elite. I mean, if we're thinking about, you know, there were lots of women in the in the Tunisian national dialogue. There were lots of women in the elite bargains in, in, in Ukraine, but these were women who were part of the traditional parties, which I think helps also to bring some nuances. You know, we're not talking about just any women will change the results uh, automatically. Uh, and the fact that women are there doesn't necessarily mean that they are representing civil society and that they are necessarily uh, progressive in their demands and so forth. But I would say, I mean, some maybe some uh, some thoughts as to why we found that, that uh, relation to be statistically st significant. Um, I would say on the one hand, my hint is that the fact that women are there, whether they are invited or allowed to participate or whether they asserted themselves to be there, is an indication that, um, that whoever is convening this dialogue is generally interested in taking a comprehensive approach to addressing the root causes of inequality and injustice. Um, and I would say also my hint is that when women are at the table, there's going to be generally a higher chance that a progressive reform agenda will be advanced as opposed to an elite pact. Women will have more interest in making sure that the new constitution, for instance, will be granting um, rights to all segments of society and so forth. Um, and then maybe a last element that I, that I would like to add is that, and that's kind of more based on anecdotal, anecdotal evidence. I, I spoke to a few women uh, activists who had the chance to be involved in negotiation processes, and I had the feeling that due to the quality of women, they tended to have a higher propensity for playing bridging roles between opposing positions, between uh, within the movements or between movements at the constituencies, between the movements and the state. There's something about, about them being women that, that brings that, that extra quality to them. And again, because it's anecdotal evidence, I think there's a lot of more research that is needed on that. And actually my organization, the Bogle Foundation, is conducting some work with you and women to understand women as inside the mediators within pro-democracy movements to try and verify whether that's a, that's a, that's actually true or if it's just a myth that we think that women you know are necessarily more uh, more inclusive and and building more bridging than than their male counterparts. Uh, Verity, thank you so much for that. We're at the end of uh, our webinar today. I hope that everyone joins me in thanking Jonathan, Veronique, Roman, Zara, and Zaid for joining us from Tunis, from Khartoum, from Berlin, and from here in Washington. This is the third in our four-part series on people, power, peace, and democracy. The fourth session uh, will be on the 11th of May. We hope all of you are able to join us. We do have a recording of today's webinar, and you can find it on usip.org slash events. Thank you, everyone, for being with us, and a very big thank you to our panelists. Good morning.